All right, y'all. We give praise, esteem, and honor to the Most High Yah by way of Yahusha Hamashiach. And let's look at uh First Kings chapter eleven. Well, John chapter five, verse thirty-nine, and then First Kings chapter eleven. Let's get ready to embark on a very vast undertaking. For those of you don't know, I I, I somebody uh, sent it to me, and I got it. I believe that was Dominique. That phone number will change as you hear on July the twelfth. I will make sure that I send that out to whatever that number is when it changes. Uh, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of Elohim in you. I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one from another, and not the honor that come from Elohim only? First Kings chapter 11. So, just to let that be stated and let that be known. Hold on. I got to find it. We are dealing with the relevance and the parallels of the split of the kingdom from the time of the split to the rejoining. How Yasharal did what they wanted to do and that how Yehuda stood on Yah's ways. Do not get it twisted. Because Yehuda definitely did buck from time to time. And so I don't want you to think that, that Yehuda, that Judah was just completely absolved from doing wickedness. Because they surely were not. They surely were not. First Kings chapter 11. And we'll look at certain kings of Yasharal this evening. Because since it's a large undertaking, we're trying to catch everything that we possibly can when it comes to this right here. First Kings chapter 11 and uh, about verse 9. First Kings 11 and uh, 9. First Kings 11 and 9. And it says that Yahuwah was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from Yahuwah Elohim of Yasharal, which had appeared unto him twice. And he had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which Yahuwah commanded. Wherefore Yahuwah said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. Now, if we're standing in, in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Now, this is a whole particular matter. I want you to sit back and look at uh, what this is. Come to Ezekiel 36. He said that he'll do this for, for David's sake, for his beloved's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, or why he left a tribe for Solomon. And I'm going to sit back and, and we're going to sit back and look at that. It's something we discussed last Shabbat day for the reason why. Ezekiel 36. I want to say about verse 27. My apologies. Verse 31. Ezekiel 30, 36 and 29 actually. 36 and 29. He said, I will also save you from all your uncleanliness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and increase, and the increase of the field, that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Now pause and hold this here, because I'm trying to word this out. I'm, come over here to Amos, because he said that he will increase the corn, and lay no famine on you. Then he said he will multiply the fruit of the tree to increase it, that you will have no more dishonor of famine amongst the heathen. Now let me look at this word famine real fast. Bear with me. Why you swing the Amos chapter 8? Where is that word I'm looking for? Bomb, there we go. Famine. And this one here that's just is why we're going to Amos chapter 8. But this is famished or a dearth or a hunger. And that word is Rahab. Now let's look at this here, right? And I could just be dealing with the word itself. Now keep this in mind because he said he was split it. But he leaves son in Jerusalem for David his servant's sake, for his beloved's sake. Amos 8. 
Amos 8 and 11. Behold, the days come, saith Yahuwah Elohim, that I will send a famine in the land, not a fa famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of Yahuwah. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of Yahuwah, and shall not find it. And that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria, keep that in mind about that sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O Dan, live, and the manner of Beersheba live, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Now, we dealt with that particular thing, but we're going to look at that sin of Samaria, and we're going to actually look at, begin the process of when Samaria was created and what the sin of Samaria has been consistently. Because that same sin of Samaria is what caused the kingdom to be split in the first place. And which is really still Yasharal's problem to this day. Even those who profess to be followers of the way or in the truth. As so many people like to say. Uh, John chapter 6. Hello. Hello. Six and thirty-two. Well, six and thirty-one. Your fathers were in the wilderness, and they thought that they were going to perish from a famine. This is why Yah told them in Deuteronomy chapter eight that a man doth not live by bread alone, but every word that proceed out the mouth of Yahuwah does man live. They thought in the process of what they were experiencing is that they were going to perish from famine. And people are perishing from famine right now as we speak because they perishing through the desire of hearing the word of Yahuwah and they are not hearing it. And a lot of people think they're hearing the word of Yahuwah, but he said his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. Sheep get fed by a shepherd, therefore they never lack and they're never hungry. So let's look at what he tells you in John chapter 6 verse 31. He said, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from Shamahim to eat. Then Yahusha said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from Shamahim, but my father gave you the true bread from Shamahim. For the bread of Elohim is he which come down from Shamahim and give life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Master, evermore give us this bread. Yahusha said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that come to me shall never hunger, and he that believe on me shall never thirst. Now notice this is what he told you in Ezekiel 36, that you would bear no more famine or reproach among the heathen, that you would no longer be amongst these people and not have any word. So I'm going to show you why he said this here. Just bear with me. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Because that dishonor will be removed from amongst you while you are amongst the heathen, which is translated and correlated. You understand something? With the split of the kingdom began the reproach amongst the heathen or the dishonor. And most high willing, as we proceed on this undertaking, you will see how he said he will destroy the temple in Jerusalem and that it would be a reproach in the time amongst the heathen or a dishonor or a stain or a mark. You know, sin is a dishonorable thing for a person to have. We don't look at it as a dishonorable thing. You know what I'm saying? And one of the things that you're going to look at when we go through this is this. Is that when Yahuwah has instructed you in the way that you ought to go. He will rebuke you and chastise you in compassion to get you to turn before he render, renders his wrath upon your head for your straight insolence, your straight disobedience, and your outright and utter defiance. You know what I'm saying? Because that man's not going to let that slide. Because the thing with the goodness and the severity of you, who has it stated in Romans chapter 11, is this. Before he crashes your head, and this is in 2 Chronicles 36 as well, before he crashes your head, he sends people to warn you to turn from your evil and wicked ways. Just like he did with Nineveh. Just like he did with your people. He said, I sent the prophets up time to you, be time early, rising and sending them, and you would not hear. See, I think sometimes people get it twisted on how this comes. See, like with Solomon, he came and warned. He, he, when, when Solomon did what he did, he didn't feel the need to have to come warn Solomon and tell him this here because I appeared to you a couple of times already. And you already know what the lick read. You already know you wrong. He said, but he still showed mercy on him by, I'm not going to snatch this kingdom from you while you're alive. I'm not going to do it until after you're dead. Now, we're actually going to end up looking at Most High Will and probably Shabbat night. How you will see that the seeds for the kingdom being split was already started with Saul and David. It was infighting, though, within the same kingdom, so to speak, because of Saul's 
lack of steadfastness to the word, which is a semblance to come of those kings that are in Yasharal who ended up getting the majority of the tribes because of their lack of steadfastness. See, your lack of steadfastness can lead to you being severed very, very quickly. And even in the midst of you being severed, this man will allow you to continue on and be strengthened in your wickedness to your ultimate destruction. So don't think because things may be seeming to go your way or you're seeming to get the things that you desire, you won't. So that means Yahuwah is prospering you in the midst of you being in iniquity, transgression, and rebellion. Because I want you to understand something. Iniquity is lawlessness. That means you just outright doing what you want to do. There's a difference. Transgression is the breaking of a particular precept, commandment, statute, or ordinance. You know what I'm saying? And rebellion is outright bucking. See, there's different things. You have a sin, which is a transgression of the law, which is the same thing. You may have violated one law. Which in turn you violated them all, according to James. But then you have iniquity, which is lawlessness. You don't abide in anything. You do what you want to do. But rebellion, which is probably the worst of the three, is you know what is right, but you choose to do what you want to do anyway. See, that's the difference between iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. I'm just doing what I want to do. You may or may not know the totality of the situation, but rebellion, you know. And that's why the book says, as we looked at it Saturday, there is no sacrifice for willful sin. It does not exist in the law. This is where the, this is why he said you, you're just sitting around waiting for judgment. That is something to consider. Nevertheless, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let me get to the main point, what I'm really trying to work to, about him leaving a tribe for Jerusalem, for beloved, and for the city of Shalom. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3. Well, uh, actually, verse 1, I'm sorry. And it shall come to pass when all the things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither you who the Elohim have driven thee. He say, when you sit back, and this is what Ezekiel 36 is pointing to. And this is what is really, it's not waking up to your nationality like stupid niggas want to tell you. You know what I'm saying? You're calling to mind Yahusha HaMashiach. That's what you're calling to mind. Because this is talking about what happens when you repent. And thou shalt return to you who the Elohim and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Then, that then you who are thy Elohim will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither you who the Elohim have scattered thee. And if any there be driven out of the outermost parts of Shamahim, from thence will you the Elohim gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And you the Elohim will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And you the Elohim will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love you the Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou may live. Now, notice that he said he will circumcise your heart when you return or when you repent. Now let's look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 28. What we're looking at is, and, and I don't have time to grab it now, it's 8-11, is Zechariah chapter 12. Well, it dealt with, he shall save the tents of Yehuda first. Because he said that he would leave Solomon a tribe for his beloved. Remember he said in Matthew 17 and 5, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And it says in Daniel 9 that Jerusalem had to be rebuilt for the Mashiach, for the anointed one. So for Jerusalem's sake, for the city of Shalom's sake, I will leave one. And this is another reason why he had to save the tents of Yehuda first. Because he had to leave that of what he told Solomon when he rent the kingdom from him. So this is one of the parallels and the relevance of the split and why he left that particular tribe to Solomon. Because of the, of, of the plan that was already set in place from the foundation of the world. So this has to be done in this particular fashion. What did I just say? I don't know. Oh, Romans chapter 2. Romans 2 and about 27. So when you return, which is this, again, this is dealing with your immersion. Because let's, let's, let's put it this way. When you saying that you're sacrificing yourself to Elohim, as Yahusha did, and you go in that water to be immersed. You're coming out a new creature. The old, like I said, right, and Joshua chapter 5, it says that in Gilgal, he rolled 
the way the reproach. So that old way had departed and now you're a new way, you're a new creature, so to speak, is what Yahushua Son of Noon chapter 5 is referring to. So when you're looking at you being immersed, you're supposed to be a new person. But unfortunately, too many niggas is getting immersed and coming out the water talking about they still trying to get it together or they still trying to purge their sins or they still trying to get right or they still trying to get self-control and mastery when you're supposed to have that done before you got in the water. Because you supposed to understood and knew that coming out of the water, you were a new creature and old things have passed away. Therefore, you haven't fully returned. Therefore, this man hasn't circumcised your heart. Therefore, he cannot gather you. He's not going to come pick you up and scoop you up. You need to consider that. How do you come out of the water and you still a carnal minded moving individual not being carnal as forth as being wrapped in the flesh but carnal as forth as your way of living and thought process this is not supposed to happen that man supposed to that carnal man supposed to have been left in that grave Hamashiach did not get up with flesh and blood he got up with flesh and bones contained with, with, with that outer vessel containing the Ruach inside of him and that's how we're supposed to be coming up out of that. But we come, we, we we going in as niggas and coming out as niggas. How? And we're cool with that. And there's too many excuses for it. Too many excuses for it. Why do we? Why will we? Why why are we making excuses for your life? But we like to pick at people in the world on natural things when they make excuses and do stupid stuff. But then we're supposed to be in the highest element of anything that a human being can, uh, to, can, can, can strive to in life. And we do stupid stuff and make excuses for it and try to hide under the fact that Yah is merciful. Don't hide under that for your, your excuses for mediocrity and disobedience and unbelief. That ain't cool. Just man up, woman up, and do what you got to do. Two and twenty-five. Romans. For circumcision truly profit if thou keep the Torah, but if thou be a breaker of the Torah, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the Torah, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the Torah, judge thee who by the letter in circumcision does transgress the Torah? For he is not a Yahudin, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Yahudin, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the Ruach, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Elohim. I think that'd be our biggest problem is that we seek praise from men. That's why the master turned right back around and said, How can you believe which receive honor one from another and not the honor that come from Allah only? Let's go back to First Kings. I don't want to get off too far on the tangent on uh all the thing we got to look at. So that's why you see that he, he left a he left a, a, a tribe for Solomon. But let's look at some of the adversaries that Solomon had to begin to face. And then we'll get to Jeroboam and then proceed to look at the first king of Yashorah, which would be Rehoboam. We're looking at verse 14 in uh, first king chapter 11. Yahuwah stirred up an adversary under Solomon, had to add the Edomite. He was of the king's seeds in Edom. For it was come to pass when David was in Edom and Joab the captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Yasharal until he cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled and he and certain Edomites of his father's servants were with him to go into Mishraim. Hadad being yet a little child. What does that sound? What similitude do you hear from that? Do you hear about that you get from that? I didn't want somebody to ask, answer that for me. What you get from that similar two that you hear right there? Anybody? Anybody got anybody want to take a shot at that? Don't everybody run that once now. Read it again. I was gonna say Mashiach preaching in the temple when he was young. No, it said that the king seed 
And that uh, when David, when Joab, the host, was going up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom, that this particular young man fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, and went into Egypt, and he was yet a little child when he fled into Egypt. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think I understand that word. Go ahead. No, not Moses. Who the, go ahead. What you were finna say? Who said never mind? Don't try to. I thought Will was already. Will had already said how much y'all was not, didn't he? Yeah, he, say in, he said in the temple. He was in the temple. Now, that ain't in the. But I, 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 thought, I thought you said in the temple. I thought you said in the temple. That's why I said never mind. Oh, no, 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 no. What that is, is. Was not Herod killing all the young babies in the Mashiach when it fled in, into Egypt? Just like, was he not of the king's seed, being a, that Yahuwah is the king according to Psalm 24? Yeah, that's what I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's what you think. You think on the right line. Just sit back and look and say he rose up an adversary. But you just sit back seeing how a king fled from being killed. See, it's, it's always little small things like this here. You have some people say that ain't, that's talking about Edomite and this, that, there, and the third. But it's right there. The king seed fled because they were seeking to, to eliminate this here. And he was a but a small child and he got missing. And the word, and the man's name had that. His name is, I shall move softly, I shall love. So you have a man whose name basically means love was raised up to punish Solomon for his sins. Now we'll sit back and look at how Yahusha was raised up. He's the one that loves, but yet he was raised up as a punishment for the people's sins who will reject him and not listen. You know what I'm saying? The reason why we have to sit back and look at this here is that there is a punishment for disobedience. Now Solomon didn't get off scot-free. Not only was the kingdom ran from him, but then he had to be punished for it. Now let's look at, we're going to look at what Hadad did when he was raised up to be an adversary to him. And then we'll look at the parallel to the master. So it says, uh, and they arose out of Midian, this is verse 18, and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Mishraim, under Pharaoh, king of Mishraim, which gave him a house and appointed him victuals, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Taphaz the queen, and the sister of Taphaz bare him Jenabath his son, whom Taphaz weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Jenabath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Misraim that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab the captain of the host was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart, that I may go into my own country. It's not that the same thing. Now let's look if we can see that same thing in Matthew chapter 2. Let's see if the let's see if this Malachine tell him once he hear Herod is dead for him that he can slide back around there where he came from. Matthew two and thirteen. We'll start there and then work our way around. They say when they departed, behold, the Malachim of Yahuwah appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother. And flee into Mizraim, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Mizraim, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Yahuwah by the prophet, out of Mizraim I have called my son. Now just drop to verse 19, because we're getting short on time. But when Herod was dead... Behold, a Malachim of Yahuwah appeared in a dream to Yosef and Misraim, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Yasharal, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Yasharal. And when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Yehuda in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of Elohim in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So when we come back to 1 Kings chapter 11. And we look at verse 22. It says that Pharaoh said unto him. But what has thou lacked with me? That behold thou seek to go to thy own country. And he answered nothing. How be it let me go in any wise. Now. Now think about this here as we look at Hadad. It basically means I shall love. It's being raised up to punish the people for their sins. How do you think 
that the father went about to raise up Yahusha to punish the people for their sins. How do you think he went about to do this here to punish the people for this? Because we look at it this as this here, right? The master said he didn't come to judge nor to condemn, but he came to save. But yet at the same token, let's look at Romans chapter eleven on what I'm trying to trying to explain so y'all can understand clearly what I'm trying to say. Romans eleven. And by verse 18. It's kind of what we, sat, what we sat back and talked about a couple weeks ago about uh, uh, how that which would be for your good would be for your welfare. And we'll look at this one particular instance of how he is raised up to be an adversary or a punishment to the people's sins because punish the people for their sins because he is a punishment he is to punish the people for their sins because the people would not hear or accept him which means they would not hear and accept Yahuwah therefore he has to raise up to be an adversary against them therefore he has to be an enemy against them because they were enemies against um, to themselves and we'll sit back and look at that as well as a statement that, that Timothy said He say, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bear not the root, but the root thee. Yeah. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I may be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if Elohim spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of Elohim, on them which fail severity. But towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Now, when we look at Solomon, Solomon did not continue in, in Yahuwah's goodness. Therefore, he got the kingdom split. He got the kingdoms cut off because he didn't continue in that. And we have to sit back and consider that. You can be severed from the things that Elohim has given you because you don't continue in his goodness. And therefore, his severity has to fall upon your head. Nobody wants to look at the severity. Everybody wants to feel like they're the one going to get mercy and other people are not, even though they're committing the same iniquity that other people are committing. That is not just nor right in the eyesight of Yahuwah and not just nor right according to the word of Yahuwah. That's pure self-serving wickedness, the thoughts of vain men who want justification for their wickedness as if this man owes them repentance for their insolence. Nevertheless, let's look at John chapter 9. See, remember in Luke, in Luke chapter 13, the master had stated plainly, that do you think that these people are sinners above all sinners? He said, I say nay. He said, unless you repent likewise, you shall also perish. See, when he told you in the 15th chapter of John that he came to do the work that none other man did, therefore you had not had sin. Now you therefore have no cloak for your sin. That was him being an adversary to rise up for the punishment of those who would not hear, those who would not obey. Because Solomon had to be punished for not obeying, so he had to raise up an adversary, someone to contend with him. See, in Proverbs 28 and 4, it says, The righteous uphold the law, and they contend with those that don't. I know I just quoted that entirely wrong. But it actually says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. And this is why you see Hamashiach steadily contending with the scribes and Pharisees. That's why you see a lot of contention, period. Some contention you see amongst our people is strictly contention because niggas like to argue like women. You know what I'm saying? They just like to bicker and go back and forth for the flexing of their vain knowledge and information which they have puffed up in their vain and carnal minds. But then you have some people who are contending with people because these individuals are wicked. They have no desire to walk in righteousness. Yet though they like to proclaim the name of Yahuwah. Are you dropping that on? What is that? A papaya? You putting salt on that? It's It's somebody. It's very weird. Like sweet and sour, uh, no, it's not. It's sour, just sour no. Sweet, it's sour. not. That's nothing like that. John? No, I do not. No, I do not. I will pass. I have high blood pressure, sir. I have hypertension. Are you trying to get, give me a stroke? Maybe. You know what I'm saying? Drink some water, all right? No, man. You gonna pay for the funeral? Maybe. No, I got a life insurance policy. You ain't gotta pay for it. I, ain't, I won't pay for it. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> please don't. Yeah, don't put me in a bad bad suit though. 
Let the nigga say, I'm going to come back and haunt me a nigga. Nigga put me in a bad suit. Bear me with some street clothes on. No, nah, bear me with some street clothes on. Nah, you gonna get your old fresh tailor made? Nine and thirty-five. That, that nigga, mm -hmm. uh, what that nigga say? What that nigga name is? Charlo. No, nah, oh God, no. What that nigga name is? Dang. Styles Pete, man. Like he say, you know, bear me with street clothes on. Nine and thirty-five. Yahoo Shah heard when they had cast him out. When he had found him, he said unto him, "Does thou believe on the son of Elohim?" He answered and said, "Who is he, master, that I might believe on him?" Yahusha said unto him, Thou have both seen him, and it is he that talked with thee. Now, we just are using this one thing, of he, how he was an adversary to the people here. We didn't read the whole story, but this is the instance of where he healed a blind man, that the power of Elohim might be manifested upon this blind man. And the people, the Yahudim, the scribes, the Pharisees, all of them contended with this man, stating how wicked Yahusha had to be, and how was he healed. In this instance, Yahusha is raised up as an adversary against these people because they're speaking and condemning their own selves and damning their own soul. Listen to what he tell them. Yahusha said, For judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were, were, were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Yahusha said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remain. Now this is as simple as this here, right? And I'm, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've said it before, maybe not in these particular words. Uh, not in these particular words. Proverbs 28 and 13 tells us that if a man covereth his sins, he shall not prosper. But he that confess and forsake them shall have mercy. And 1 John chapter 1 tells us the same thing. That if we don't confess our sins, then we lie and say the truth is not in us. But if we confess them and forsake them, then the blood of Hamashiach is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can have fellowship with him and be accepted. What the scribes and Pharisees, what he was basically telling them, they said that they could see, but yet they were blind. That means you niggas know the word. You know right from wrong, yet you do what you want to do, but yet you say you are light to the blind and that you righteous and upright. That man said you ought to perish. I'm going to read that to you again. Listen to what he said. He said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remain. See, this is the opposite of this right here in Romans chapter 16. See, I don't want y'all walking around here telling people, that you can see because then your sin remain because nigga you know what you doing you know the wickedness that you are a part of and that you privy of and you do just like what he said in Matthew 23 you trying to appear righteous unto men but in, 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 inside you full of iniquity and dead man's bones and you want to cover up your wickedness so that no one is aware of it and we can't live like that Romans 16 and 11 not finna live like that don't play with your life like that I done told y'all this numerous times. If you go, if you know you don't want to do right, not 11 y'all, I'm sorry, 16 and about uh, 17. If you know you're not going to do right, then just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it at all. Don't flodge and pump fake. Have people out here blaspheming this man's word. And that's why some people don't get no word. That's why he say they have a famine. He say, but for those that have repented, and we didn't even read all the way down to Ezekiel 36, where he say, be ashamed for he doesn't do this. For your sake, he do this for his name's sake. He didn't keep Jerusalem and Yehuda for Solomon's sake. He did it for his beloved's sake or for Yahushua's sake. He didn't do it for that. See, we turn around and sit back and look at it. This man do stuff for us when he do this stuff for himself. That's the pride and the haughtiness of heart that we possess because we really think that this man owe us and that he works for us when we owe him and we work for him. That's where we get the game twisted at. He said, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. You already told you? Anybody that calls them, remember, right? Proverbs chapter 6 tells you that those that sow discord among brethren, that's an abomination. Those are six things that y'all hate. Yeah, even seven are an abomination. So he tells you that if you mark or are you able to identify people that cause divisions and people that make offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have received, he told you to leave them alone. And that's going back in the law. That's not my personal. See, I told y'all this before. And I'm going to keep it plain. This is where niggas, when niggas go off or niggas do this and niggas do that, 
and then you show people out the word what the word say, and you allow people to make the determination of how they're going to deal with them according to the word, this is what people come in at and say, you trying to make people not deal with me, or you trying to make people do this or do that, you know what I'm saying, because they decide to leave, or they commit in sins, or this the case, in the case may be, well, no, this is what the word says. An individual can judge it and move according to what the word say, because that's the only way we're supposed to move. If you cause divisions amongst the people, the word say, I'm not supposed to fool with you. You know what I'm saying? Period. That's not how I personally feel. I can't tell anybody individually what to do. All you can do is give them counsel and a recommendation. See, there's a difference of giving a recommendation and giving a directive on this is what you have to do. You know what I'm saying? It's as you're personally speaking. Because if the book say, if this person is committing an offense contrary to doctrine, y'all know the law say you're supposed to get that evil from amongst you. Now, you know you ain't got no business stoning nobody because as soon as you stone them, you're going to need to be stoned. You know what I'm talking about? So what do you do? You separate. How can you be consecrated? How can you be sanctified? How can you be Kadesh and dwell amongst iniquity when your Elohim don't do it? That's the whole point of why he's telling you to separate yourself. That was the point of him telling you to get the evil from amongst you because he's going to get the evil from amongst you. This was the purpose of the separation because of the evil that was amongst you because of idolatrous worship. Solomon was worshiping idols. This is what caused everything to be split. He said, for they that are such serve not our master, Yahushua HaMashiach, but their own belly. So when he tell you people that's causing divisions and people who commit an offense is contrary, they don't serve the master, they serve Satan. Because he said they serve their own belly. You know from the law that the serpent was cursed to go upon his belly, and you have of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. That's what the book says. That's what the text says. you got to take that up with Yahuwah. See, at the end of the day, everybody love Yahuwah until the word starts pointing out things that they may be doing contrary to the word. Then it's not the word talking no more. That's your personal opinion and what you want people to do towards them because you got a problem with them or you mad with them versus this is what the books say. Because it's always funny to me that niggas don't say that when they talking about other people. But if they feel like it's resting on their head, then it's different. You don't seen it. Have you seen that yourself? That nigga just sucking on that mango. He don't care what I'm talking about. It's a good mango. I've seen this here. Not just not just directly with I done seen this outside of us. Inside of I done seen that. You know what I'm saying? When they see that word coming and they looking at people who in the world or other people who may be in the world as part of different organizations, they can look at him like that. Yeah, I can't I can't fool with you. You wicked. Till that word starts slicing and dicing them, then it's the problem with you. And it ain't the word no more. You know what I'm saying? That same judgment that you want to throw on somebody else's lap, when that junk crashing you upside your head for what you're doing, now it's just a preacher trying to make people look at you different or make people not fool with you. That's evil and that's unjust and that's showing the outright blatant disregard for this man's directives and the lack of faith that people actually possess in him. And that people just doing this for appearance and in, and in, and in, and in word only, but not in deed and truth. And we can't operate like that. That's why he say by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's how people. That's how Satan got Eve, and that's how these niggas be getting people. Nice smooth word. The book tell you about that. Then your enemy come and his words smoother than oil. But watch them old butter soft nigga with them smooth words. I done told you about niggas who come flatter you all the time. People who come with nice words and flattery all the time. They don't mean you no good. Cause nine times out of ten they trying to trip you up. He say, for your obedience is abro gone abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Thank you. And that's how you have to turn around and look at this here, right? We need to be wise concerning that which is good and a straight dummy and a simpleton and a fool to that which is evil, to therefore that we can't execute it. I sent a couple people this little quote from 33 Strategies of War. And I just really think about it in terms of the word or what it was stated. He said to be able to vanquish your enemy, you have to know your enemy. In order for Yahusha to vanquish sin, he had to become sin. In order for him to vanquish death, he had to become death. And we have to do the same thing. In order to destroy your enemy, you must know your enemy. And in order to know your enemy, that's why you say you got to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You have to know your enemy to defeat him. 
You can't defeat someone and you don't know how they move. These Caucasians in America study you and watch you and everything that you do. This is why they come with all the cuts and means to try to destroy you. The only reason why they haven't destroyed you is because Yah's mercies are faithful that we are not consumed. Because if it wasn't for him, we would be consumed because they study you. If you want to defeat sin and you want to defeat the adversary, then you must know your enemy in order to defeat him. And to know your enemy is to know the word because the word is diamet diametrically opposed to your enemy. And it shows you his wiles and how to defeat him. Yahusha defeated the enemy by his steadfast belief and obedience in his father and the reward. Therefore, he was not separated from his father. And therefore, he was able to destroy the enemy. We don't want to do that. We want to do us and then pump fake at the same time. And unfortunately, that's what Solomon did. He wanted to do him as forth as loving all of these women. He was serving his belly with all of these women. And these women caused him to go astray. Which caused the separation. Let's come back to 1 Kings chapter 11. Let's look at Yeroboam's rebellion. Verse 26. Well, hold on. Let me read you the other adversary in verse 23. Elohim stirred up him another adversary, Rizam, the son of Eladad, which fled from his master Hadadizar, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Yasharal all the days of Solomon, besides the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Yasharal and reigned over Syria. So you got two nations, the Syrians and the Edomites, causing trouble for Yasharal because of what Solomon did. And that's showing you how those that are in, uh, that are ahead, that if they're doing things that they don't have no business, it can cause the rest of the people to be troubled. So you have to, you, you have to be cognizant of that, whether you're leading the congregation, whether you're a husband leading your home, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. Because what you're doing can, may not just affect you, it may affect others. Only selfish men don't consider that. Because a real man is going to consider that his actions have ramifications on people other than himself. Unfortunately, you have to, when I told y'all in the book, speak of people being lovers of themselves, that's being selfish. They're only thinking of themselves. Being lovers of yourself is not, oh, I love me and vanity and such aspect. It can be, but it's selfishness though. Because you love yourself more than you love other people. Once you, if you identify someone as selfish, in my personal opinion, till they remedy themselves from that affliction, it is not possible for them to love and care for another person in completion, period. It's impossible. Because they're always going to put their interests before anyone else's. Selfish people cannot sacrifice. They don't know the definition of it. It's not in their makeup. It's not in their character. It's not in their personality. Verse 26. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the Ephratite of Zerada, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the Malik. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the Malik, Solomon, and built Melo, and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, made him a ruler over, uh, over the charge of the house of Yosaf. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahiah the Shilite found him in the way and clad him with himself with a new garment, and they two were alone in the field. And Ahiah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith Yehud, the Elohim of Yasharal, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give thee ten tribes. But he shall save one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Yasharal, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in my eyes, and to keep my statutes, my judgments, as David his father. Now we'll skip over Rabon for the moment. And we'll, we'll look at 1 Kings chapter 14 and we'll because we done talked about Rehoboam a, a good little bit. So we'll skip over him. And we'll slide to actually 1 Kings chapter 15 actually. And about verse 25. And we will look at this particular king of Yasharal. Uh, Yashar His name is Nadab. And he's the son of Jeroboam. And we'll look at him first because we got to run some of these kings down before we slide out of here. 
And Nadab the son of Jeroboam began to reign in Yasharal in the second year of Asa king of Yehuda, and reigned over Yasharal two years. And he did evil in the sight of Yehuda, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin where if he made Yasharal to sin. Now we'll come back and look at his sin, we discuss it, but we'll hit it for a refresher though. And Basha the son of Ahiah of the house of Issachar conspired against him. Basha smote him at Gibeathon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Yasharal lay siege to Gibeathon. And even in the third year of Asa, king of Yehuda, did Basha slay him and reigned in his steed. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam, and he left not the Jeroboam any that breathed until he destroyed him according unto the saying of Yahuwah, which he spake by his servant Ahiah the Shilonite, and we'll look at what he told him. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned, which he made Yasharal sin by his provocation, wherewith he provoked Yahuwah Elohim of Yasharal to anger. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Yasharal? And there was war between Asa and Basha the king of Yasharal all their days. And we'll look at King Asa, and see how we're going to sit back and look at that Asa stood on the ways of Yahuwah and Basha did not. Therefore, they had a running feud and a battle because of Basha's disobedience. He said, in the third year of Asa, the king of Yehuda began Basha, the son of Ahia, to reign over all Yasharal and Tizrah twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of Yahuwah and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin wherewith he made Yasharal to sin. Now let's go back and let's look at Jeroboam's sin and let's look at what he did. Chapter 12, verse 25. For this here, right, we're going to just look at a lot of history. Uh, truth be told is what we're going to be looking at. But in the midst of that, you're going to see these parallels. And the thing that, that Jeroboam caused the people to do is he caused the people to worship idol gods. And then those sons continue to pick that process up and teach that to the people. And the people followed in that. And therefore that caused the wrath to come upon the heads of all Yasharal because of what this man was teaching the people. And then those who actually stood on Yah's ways, there was contention. Like we mentioned in Proverbs 28 and 4, they contended. And this goes back to Genesis 3 and 15. There's enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And it's going to be fighting. I don't know why people think it's going to be any different. People, honestly, people don't actually read the word, study the word, know the word. So they say things that are not according to the word. And then when you show what the word actually says, then they think you just saying that to be self-serving. Then Jeroboam built Sechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. And went out from thence and bent Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to sacrifice in the house of Yahuwah at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn against their master, even unto Rehoboam, king of Yehuda. And they shall kill him, kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Yehuda. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Yasharal, which brought thee up out of the land of Mishraim. And he set up one in Bethal, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan, and he made of the house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And remember, we dealt with this not too long ago. And then he even made him a fake tabernacles. And you see that he say he took counsel. He took unto people unto him itching ears, because he had itching ears. But his desire was vain esteem. Because he was looking that he didn't want to lose the kingdom, even though Yahuwah had already told him that it was his. By the mouth of the prophet of high, it was his. So he didn't need to worry about the people going back to Rehoboam because it wasn't going to happen. But all he wanted was the esteem of the people to the point that he would cause the people to worship idols. That he would, he would use sin. This is how wicked men move. He used sin to control the people because it's easier to do so by appealing to the people's desires. And he tried to appeal to the people why it's a long way to go to Jerusalem. Come up here and worship because it's convenient for you. You know what I'm saying? Now you have to sit back and look at that. That these people rather be immersed in sin for convenience of travel than obedience by getting on your horse and getting to where you need to be at. Now how wicked is that? That he put that together in his mind. They're going to go to Jerusalem. Don't go over there. See, I'm going to give you this over here. I'll even make a tabernacle for you. You ain't even got to go down now. 
Just stay up here with me. Let's see how that played out for him. Let's see how that played out for him. First Kings chapter 13 and verse 4. Make it verse. Uh, we'll look at verse 1 because we got to cover cover everything. We got to cover everything. Not going to read this whole chapter, but we got to try to cover it. I said I was going to be detailed with it. And if we don't hit it, we just continue it on. But we got to hit everything. He said, Behold, there came a man of Elohim out of Yehuda by the word of Yehuah under Bathal, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of Yehuah, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith Yehuah, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave his sign in the same day, saying, This is the sign which Yahuwah hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king Jeroboam heard this saying, of the man of Elohim, which he had cried against the altar in Bethal, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him the altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of Elohim had given by the word of Yahuwah and the Malik answered and said unto the man of Elohim entreat now the face of Yahuwah the Elohim and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again and the man of Elohim besought Yahuwah and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before you can line that up with Mark chapter 3 with the man with the withered hand who Hamashiach healed that way you can line that up at. Well, now you sit back and you see that he's sitting back and he's telling he's telling Jeroboam that all these altars and these false priests and these idols and these false gods and these false sacrifices that they're doing, that he's going to come and destroy it. And this is showing you how later, whether it be with the man of sin, that all the idols that men have constructed, that in due time he will come and destroy them. Whether you got idols made up in your heart or whether you worship an idols made with hands, he's eventually going to come to destroy that. Do not think that he will not, especially if you have idols set up in your heart. Nevertheless, we won't go any further into this here. Let's swing over here to chapter 14. Swing over here to chapter 14, 1 Kings 14, because that's dealing with that uh, man that... Uh, Uh, what the name is? The prophet that didn't go back like he was supposed went didn't go the way that he's supposed to. We're not gonna read all that. That's not really dealing with what we got to deal with this evening. First, chapter fourteen, verse one. At the time that Abiyah the son of Jeroboam fell sick, Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself that thou not be known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. And behold, there is a higher the prophet which told me that I should be king over this people. And take with thee ten loaves and crack nails and a cruise of honey and go to him. And he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. Your born's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahiah. But Ahiah could not see for his eyes were set by reason of his age. Excuse me. Be and Yahuwah said unto Ahiah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam come to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall thou say unto her, for it shall be when he she come in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so when I heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feign thyself to be another? For I have sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith you, Elohim of Yasharal, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people, Yasharal, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to thee, yet thou hast not been as my servant David. Who kept my commandments and which followed me with the with his all his heart to do that only which was right in my eyes. But thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and has cast me behind thy back. Now this is what we sit back and turn around and that's what we do. We cast this man behind our back. That's what we like to do. Know the man word, cast him behind your back. You ain't see this man come through and chastise this man about nothing. He came straight for dome peace because I had done hollered at you and you bucked me. I even promoted you and set you up and you bucked me. He said, therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that piss against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Yasharal and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man take away dung till it be all gone. Him that die of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. Him that die in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And Yahuwah have, for Yahuwah have spoken it. Arise therefore and get thee to thy own house. And when thy feet enter the city, the child shall die. 
and all Yasharal shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Yeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good, for there is found some good thing towards you who are Elohim and Yasharal and the house of Yeroboam. For over you who shall raise up a king over Yasharal, who shall cut off the house of Yeroboam that day, but what even now? For you who shall smite Yasharal as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Yasharal out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river because they have made their groves and provoking to anger. Provoking Yahuwah to anger. And he shall give Yasharal up because of the sins of Yeroboam who did sin and who made Yasharal to sin. And Yeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him in all Yasharal mourned according to the word of Yahuwah, which he spake by the hand of his prophet, a high, so by his servant, a high the prophet. Now notice what he did to this man. Not only did he tell him that he'd take the kingdom from him, but he told him he'll kill everybody in his family. And that the child that they came to inquire, he killed that child too. And this goes into what we were talking about the other day, last week. When you look at when Yah, when Yah severs and splits people away from certain people. Because he splits certain people away from certain people because he doesn't, he hasn't appointed you to wrath. Like he told you, to keep, like Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, that he have not appointed us to wrath, but to attain salvation by Yahushua HaMashiach. This is where the separation come in at. This is why he said, though hand be joined in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished. This is why he releases your hand from some people, because he has reserved these people for wrath, and he has not reserved you for wrath. So therefore, he does not want you to be caught up in the wrath with them. That's what you should learn when you look at the story of where the Levites separated themselves from the people who, who worshipped the golden calf. They were not reserved unto the wrath that fell upon the people because he had not reserved them. He had not appointed them to wrath. Those people were already appointed to wrath. Jeroboam was appointed to wrath because you knew what he was going to do. And he gave him the opportunity to hang himself. Because sometimes you can't give people authority because he already know what they're going to do with it. Because they're more concerned with keeping it than actually doing what this book say, irregardless of who may fall away from you in the process. Nevertheless, because i got to go a little bit over 9 o'clock, forgive me. Chapter 15 and verse 9 to look at Asa, how he got it in and went to battling with this wicked nigga Nadab. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about Basha and then uh, we'll... He got to clean that stock for now. And in the 20th year, year born king of Yasharal reigned Asa over Yehuda. 41 years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Absalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of Yehuda, as David his father's. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father made. So he got all them faggots from up out of there now. Now, his daddy is Abijam, and we didn't read about him. He was wicked. We'll come back to him. He was an old wicked nigga. And Malachi's mother, even he removed her from being Malachi because she had made an idol in the grove and Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the cook of kid drum. You see how strong Asa was? Asa got his mama up out of there. You got some nigga that you know, that's my mama. You know, it's okay. That's mom, you know. She doesn't mean any harm. She's just trying to, trying to get it right. Nah, mama, get your stinking wicked butt up out of here. Get your wicked butt up out of here. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with Yahuwah all his days. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself dedicated in the house of Yahuwah, silver, gold, and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Basha, Malik of Yasharal, all their days. And Basha, Malik of Yasharal went up against Yehuda and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or to come into Asa, Malik of Yehuda. This is how evil Basha was. Asa is a righteous man, and this man set up roadblocks and stumbling blocks to stop people from coming unto a righteous man because he didn't care about these people's souls. All he cared about was keeping his authority. This is Matthew 23 real fast. You got to pay attention to stuff like this here, right? And this is the, revel the, the, the relevance and the parallels that you're going to see, not just on a, a, a major, major, deeper level, but on a macro and micro level of identifying the behaviors of wicked, self-serving individuals. Because, see, he was talking, if we know that Jerusalem is the place, is the city of the great Malik, the city of Elohim, the, the city that, that, that shall be called Yahuwah is there, then this is what Basha was trying to do. Matthew chapter 23, what that verse said I desire? Matthew chapter 23. 
Verse 13. This is what Basher was trying to do. This is what he was doing. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of Shamahim against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him two for more the child of hell than yourselves. And that's what Bashar was doing with his teaching the people to worship idols, as Jeroboam did his daddy where he got it from. That they, he was making the people to be two for more the child of hell than he was. Just like Yeroboam made his son to be two for more the child of hell. And that he was stopping the people from entering into the kingdom because he was not seeking to enter in. And it was constant contention between the two as we see in Proverbs chapter 28 verse 4. And as you've seen with the scribes and Pharisees consistently with Hamashiach. You, we, we, by the time we get completed with this, y'all willing, we will see that the scribes and the Pharisees would be representative of Yasharal. Because they always contended with Yehuda or Hamashiach. Because they were causing the people to walk in their sins. See, a lot of people look at it and they say, oh, people try to use scribes and Pharisees as a wicked term. It's not necessarily you saying scribes and Pharisees are wicked. He just was stating that the majority of them were hypocrites. We know that every Pharisee wasn't a hypocrite. We know every scribe wasn't a hypocrite. You know what I'm saying? And we know now that that term is synonymous with hypocrite when it comes to people who discuss the word. But we have enough common sense and logic and reason to know that all of them weren't wicked. But they're representative of the contention between Yehuda and Yasharal. That, again, y'all willing, we will see the scribes are representative of Yasharal and Yahusha is representative of Yehuda. Because the scribes were trying to prevent people from coming to Hamashiach. They were trying to build up fortresses or stumbling blocks to keep the people from coming unto him. Just like Basha is doing here with Asa. Nevertheless, well, we want to drop that down here, right? Verse 22. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout Yah Yehuda. None was exempted. They took away the stones of Ramah, the timber thereof, wherewith Basha had built it. And King Asa built them with Gibbah, Benjamin, and Mitzpah. Hold on, I guess I got to read verse 18. My apologies. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of Yehuah and the treasures of the king of the house and delivered them to the hand of his servants. The king of Asa sent them to Benadad, the son of Tabaron, the son of Hezon, the king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There's a league between me and thee, between my father and thy father. Behold, I sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come break thy league with Bashai, king of Yasharal, that he may depart from me. So Benadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of the host which he had against the cities of Yasharal and smote Ajan and Dan and Abel Beth Makkah and all of Sinaroth with all the land of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Basha heard thereof that he left off building Ramah and dwelt in Tizara. So he brought somebody in to help him crash this nigga. This nigga leaves. He steps off. And we'll go into that to greater detail to where if if, if, there, if, there are, if there are people that are meant to be delivered and to hear the word of Yahuwah and Ruach and the truth to be saved, then Yah will remove those stumbling blocks from your way for you to get there. If you are not meant to be saved, then you just keep following a man like Basha to your destruction. Matter of fact, we'll pause because it's 9 o'clock. I don't really want to go too past for 9 o'clock. And we'll pick up looking at Basha and the rest of these wicked kings. And all of these things. But from what we looked at this evening. Because we just had to start with the baseline. Of just the foundation of everything that we're looking at. What we looked at this evening is what caused the kingdom to split. And that was Solomon's idolatrous worship. Then we've seen how Jeroboam. Ended up becoming the king of Yasharal. And the things that he did. As far as worshiping a golden calf. And trying to keep the people from coming to Yah. Because he did the same thing like we read in Matthew 23. By putting a stumbling block in their face because he wasn't seeking salvation. And then we see Basha continuing this and Nadab continuing this. And then we see Asha, Asa and Basha having war continually. And that's the common thing that you're going to see. And we're going to see how Yehuda consistently stood on Yah's ways as a similitude of Amashia consistently standing on Yah's ways. And that Yasharal consistently went against Yah's ways. Which we will see that that's how the scribes and Pharisees did it. And then we'll look at it on a mac micro level of individuals. 
and that it's always going to be contention between Yehuda and Yasharal. That's why the statement is made in Ezekiel 37, which is made when he'll make them all one and they won't beef with one another. Because the beefing was never other, other than anything but obedience versus disobedience. But praise Yah for Yahushua and the word. We stop it right here.